husband was Fire Captain John Drennan. He worked in Ladder 5 in downtown Greenwich Village in Manhattan. He'd been with the New York City Fire Department for 27 years. We had four children. Um, lived in, uh, on Staten Island, New York. He loved being a captain. He loved, um, his other family was the fire, fire department. It started like any other day. I made coffee and I brought it. We sat and sipped coffee together, uh, watching the news in the morning, you know. And later he went to work. I kissed him goodbye and said I'd see him tomorrow. Little did I know that this routine fire on a cold March night in, in 1994 was anything but routine. The, the, it, normally it would have been routine. It was a few blocks down the road from, on 6th Avenue from the fire service, really right around the corner from a, a, a terrible rundown neighborhood. And um, the landlord had done some uh, renovations on the building. He'd put in windows where, uh, to keep the air out. He narrowed the staircases to get more space in this tiny little apartment he was renting. And basically, they had polyurethane the stairs that day. So the fire, um, young couple lived there, and they put their garbage on top of the stove. And it was an old stove with the old-fashioned pilot light on top. And sadly, they went out. And because the windows were so sensitive to um, no smoke escaping, the fire just built and built and built. And when um, the alarm finally comes in, when somebody does realize that there's a fire in this place, the uh, company is there right away. The heat in that, when that door was opened by the truck company, the they rush up the stairs, and the polyurethane on the stairs follows them up. They didn't know Jimmy Young was a firefighter. His wasn't even identifiable. It was so uh, much damage to his body. My husband and Christopher Seidenberg ran up, and there was a huge security um, door, big metal door, and he used his uh, movie man ability to try to break it in with big, big bruises on his shoulder. He almost made it. In spite of the renovations, there was no fire sprinklers. I doubt um, anybody even considered it back then. I didn't know about sprinklers back then. But um, the journey that I was about to embark on um, it changed my life forever. It is a knock at the door, and it's um, a, a chief he knows, Tommy Vallabona, who's down in a uh, neighboring town. And I said, oh, hi, Tommy. He's not home. And he said, he's been hurt, Vina. Why get your coat? Now, before bunker gear, they routinely had burns on the knees or hands or whatever, so he'd been in the burn unit before. And I, our phone was at the top of the stairs, and I went, let me call him. And he goes, no, Vina, you can't call him. So this was my way of knowing, uh-oh, this is bad. Um, we got in the car, in his chief's car, and it was the longest drive of my whole life. You smell the burnt flesh. You see the agony. You, you see it. The hands are like this, you know, the burned hands. And, and basically, I remember, like, just rubbing his hair, just saying, I've always loved you, John Drennan. I've always loved you, big guy. He's the toughest man God ever put on the face of the world. And I have something precious called hope. John Drennan's going to make it, if anybody can. John's going to make it. And another fire friend of his drives us home, and the kids are oh, like terrified. I give them that hope because they believe it that night. And we go back the next morning, and basically the journey begins. I need a notebook. I need a notebook to write. Basically, um, 
I'm writing about, um, I'm talking to him. I'm writing like, you know, I, I'm telling the journal of what's going on. Um, they took you in for surgery today, John. They, um, it, it's, it's painful, like I think you know I'm there. I'm telling about the firefighters that visit him. I'm telling about like the kids and how worried they are. If a tear, I know on one page, like a, a tear sometimes would roll down. He wants to know what happened to Jimmy and what happened to Christopher. And I can't tell him. Big, brave Vina Drennan with a big mouth. I never tell him that it did. I know the minute I tell him that they're dead, that he'll die. He probably could go through the burns and those tanks they stick him in to take his skin off. And I don't think his heart could have stood that he lost two of these young firefighters. He was there for 40 days. They had done 11 surgeries on him. And that day they were doing a fairly simple thing. But they were trying to like take the cartilage and make a thumb out of it so someday he could feed himself. It was one of the easy operations. This isn't something that they felt um, was what he had been through before. The, the operations of removing the f flesh that's burned are, are really severe and it's terrifying. I, I remember sitting across from where they were working on him on a gurney and my legs were like just switching around and he opened the door and um, the liaison, his name was Patrick Brown, he came out and said, we lost him, Vina, we lost him. And we went in the room and um, I, I'm gonna tell you the truth. When somebody's that badly burned, you do not know what to hope for. The early days you hope they live, cause it's all you know. But as the days go into weeks, you don't know what to hope for. You don't know what to pray for. You can see what kind of life this man's going to have. And I thought death was merciful. Oh, I said, can you just knock me out? It hurts so much. And they said, yeah, but when you woke up, you'd still have to go through it. And anybody that's experienced loss understands that. He was a good man, and he was mine. You know, he's my kid's father, and I miss him. John Drennan has spent his whole life serving the people of um, New York City through the fire service, but he'd also been a teacher, and he'd been a football coach, and he'd been, he had a tremendous amount of people that loved him and cherished him and wanted him to live that were all too willing to speak to the press. When John died, the city of New York lost somebody they knew and they lost somebody they loved. The Cardinal um, of St. Patrick's Cathedral opened its doors. Never before had there been a funeral of a, a firefighter from New York City or a police officer. That happens routinely now, but back then it was unheard of. It was packed that day. For two blocks, the people thronged the streets. And that day, at the funeral, I vow that I want to do everything in my life, that nobody has to go through what John Drennan went through, that no family has to endure this. And damn it, I'm going to do what I can to prevent any other person from having to endure that. Sorrow, sorrow encompasses a lot of things. You're not who you are. But um, I, I want to bring it out the message of, well, let's get this job done. We can do this. Collectively, we can change fire. There's no reason that still to this day, like 3,000 people a year are dying. Horrible, wretched deaths. You hope it's in their sleep from carbon monoxide. Um, most people don't die of burns, but too many people. For everybody that dies in a fire, four of them are injured in, by being burned. I, let's stop that. Let's stop doing that. It's not about paying me because I lost my husband. Lots of people who lost their husbands. Lots of people will lose their husbands, their wives, or their sadly, terribly, their child.
but pity isn't what I, I wanted to be known for. I wanted, I wanted my life to mean something and to make John Drennan's sacrifice mean something if someone else didn't have to endure what he endured. And that's how we could validate John Drennan. That's how we could take John Drennan's suffering and make it into something that prevented another one's suffering. And he would have liked that. He would have liked that. The National uh, Fire uh, Administration says that 80% of fires are because of carelessness. So if fire is killing Americans, it's carelessness that does it. Get drunk tonight, go in your car, kill somebody, you are now accountable. But you get drunk tonight, fall asleep in your easy chair, burn down the whole apartment building, kill people, the Red Cross will come and find you a new home. Now, my, when I was a kid, drunk driving was not treated seriously. It is now. So that's what the carelessness does to us. For every one person that dies in a hurricane, tornado, or flood, 20 die in fire, okay? 80% of those fires happen in your home, happen in the home where you feel most safe, where you go to sleep at night, assuming that the smoke detector is going to give you the warning so that you can get out of your house safely. The only thing that can prevent you from dying in a fire in your home, for sure, is a residential fire um, sprinkler system. What they put in your house is a big tank in your garage, in your basement, and they hook pipes up and they put them in your sheetrock and put a little, they call it a sprinkler head, has a little glass bulb on it. And when the fire reaches uh, a heat, the wax around the little bulb melts, the little glass breaks, and will put that fire out where the fire is. So you don't have to worry about the whole other part of your house going on fire because that fire is going to be contained immediately right where it needs to be. The gallons of water, 25 gallons, will put the fire out. It's not going to reach your children in their bedroom. That's the significance of fire. It is real. 80% of fires happen in your home, usually at night. Don't think you're going to walk out. If you don't have a sprinkler system, that smoke's going to build up in a matter of a minute and a half. That smoke's going to be so black and thick that you won't know your way to the door. That smoke's going to be so thick that if you sit up in bed, it's going to burn your lungs. Fire is hot. Fire is fast and fire is black. So black you can't see. You can't get down the hall to get your child. You can't find that staircase. It's not necessarily the flames. It's the smoke that kills more people. A fire sprinkler system prevents it from getting to that level. If you live in a rural area, if you uh, live in a big city, check out what's their response time. New York City would aim for four minutes. A four minute response time is excellent. They need to be told in four minutes, your dog will be dead if you aren't unconscious already. That the fire department is not your great hope. It's really um, preventing fire in the first place. So basically, before the fire company can come with their clanging bells and their hoses and their hurriedness, that smoke has already been in your lungs. That smoke, you don't want to get carried out on a ladder. If you're getting carried out, if you're getting rescued, if that firefighter is getting a medal, it means you're in bad shape. So you got to get out really quick. You got to crawl because the heat rises, the smoke will rise. Sure thing, we know nobody dies in a house that's sprinklered. Fire sprinklers save lives. It's not just a saying. It is the truth. This is the truth that carelessness in America prevents people from hearing. You believe it will never happen to you? 
there's nobody. There's nobody in a burn unit right now that believed it was going to happen to them, that knew that that day on the calendar was they, that day they were going to be burned. There's nobody that's burying a child, and we probably lose 1,200 children a year to fire. Deaths. 1,200 children a year. Nobody knew that was the day their child was going to die. We routinely wear seatbelts. We put babies in car seats. It's an inconvenience. But we don't want our babies and our children, our most vulnerable, to die. The legislation's around the corner. Maybe it's going to come through sensible insurance companies. Maybe it's going to come from giving mortgages uh, if, if you want a federal loan. Um, Maybe if you don't give it in a new house, it's not got a sprinkler system. You need to make people want them. And to do that, you have to educate. And that's the job of Common Voices. We can continue to try to educate. It takes a tragedy in America to make a change. John would have lived if that building had sprinklers. It's not about me at all. It's about getting the story that I have journeyed through so that somebody else does not. And that vow I made of like, I don't want this to happen to anybody else.